Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of After the Slash. I am Sean Campbell. I'm joined by the AV Slasher Librarian, Joshua Rue. How are you doing today? Doing good. Got some fun stuff to talk about here on Patreon. Absolutely. You'll have to excuse me. I'm I'm losing my voice a little bit. I'm, you know, getting over being sick, but uh, I think we should be good for this episode. Um, okay, so after the slash, we just got done talking with Tim Wagner, author of Fred um Not Right Up Street Protege. That's right. A little more tired than I thought. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that episode went pretty well. Um, it was enjoyable talking to the author, and um we had a lot to talk about. Um it's a very good book, good episode. Yeah, and uh, you know he also wrote Halloween Kills and apparently uh, Terrifier Two. I'm gonna, I'm looking forward to reading that one. I uh, need to watch that movie and then read sadly, the book and then see how they go. Sadly, I I can't be narrating Halloween Kills or Terrifier Two since they're you know still being published <laughs> like just recently. Um, mm-hmm. But they're gonna be fun reads just to read in my free time. But uh, even though I gave away my copy of Protege to a subscriber. Sean has tracked down the digital copy, uh, so I can actually re-narrate that one in 2024. It's on the list. Uh, anybody curious of how the re-narrations are going to go, go and listen to the prologue and chapter one of Church of the Divine Psychopath from 2018, and then listen to the one I uploaded about three or four weeks ago, the re-slash of it. It's night and day. I think uh, the the re-narrations are something I, I should have done a, a while back now, at least on the first few. So. All right. So uh, as far as movies to talk about first, uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up was uh, Goosebumps, the TV show. So I just heard about it. I guess it came out about a month ago, and they're doing Goosebumps for a new audience. And got to say, I wanted to love it, but I didn't. I feel like it was a completely different show that they threw in a couple of Goosebumps Easter eggs and then called it Goosebumps. It doesn't doesn't feel like I remember. Um, I didn't mind the updates. It was just they tried to tie everything into a narrative and it ended up feeling more like Riverdale with a couple throwbacks. Uh, I just it was way too much drama. Oh. Didn't do it for me. Wait, is it is each episode not a different book, like in episode form? Is it like a story continuously episode to episode or something like the movie? So what it is, um, there's a central storyline. And it, it's basically these people are partying in this house that a teenager died in in the 90s. And it's 2023. Well, the basement had cursed objects, a mask, a camera of this there's a clock and the whole show is about how those cursed objects affect people but then there's this narrative that the teenager was burned alive by other kids in the neighborhood and that kid seeking revenge and he's the one that's making all these cursed objects affect people so i was like didn't we call that nightmare on elm street um all that scary stories to tell in the dark by guillermo del toro uh, I just there was one episode where like the parents are terrible parents and the kids are suffering because of what, what the parents did and ever there was one episode where everybody was screaming at everybody I just I turned it off like it cool. was just like the haunted mask was a backseat character to everybody screaming at each other and it's just so really was, just felt like watered down nightmare on Elm Street was there a night of the living dummy episode yeah and it is. I guess they tried to use the dummy as the master manipulator behind everything. And I just, Sophia finished it. I couldn't, I I quit. I'll have to, I'll give it a try, but it sounds like I'm going to hate it. I I like the whole anthology aspect where each episode is a standalone story based on one of the books. You know, Goosebumps and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark did this thing where instead of doing like an anthology movie with like, four or five short segments, you know, like theatrical, like uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie did, Twilight Zone, the movie did. They tried to make it where there was like this overlaying plot that just ties all these different stories into it. And that doesn't work like that. There's too many flavors, too many time periods. It's it's too much to go in. It's like taking all your favorite foods and merging them together. All that stuff's not supposed to go together. Like I want to see an updated hour-long episode of The Haunted Mask an hour-long updated episode of Not of the Living Dummy. Not 
an episode of characters that are in each episode who are dealing with these different goosebump stories happening. I want characters that are supposed to be there. Like that camp one. Do you remember the camp from the old Goosebumps books? You know, where they're like on another planet practicing to go to Earth or whatever. Like, yeah. stuff like that, you know, where each episode is its own story. I don't want characters that cross over. You know, that's just... That yeah, just uh, honestly, the Haunted Mask episode was going to make it or break it for me if it was great. Like, I, I hated the Haunted Mask design. Really did not do it for me. I remember reading that book as a kid. And it scared me so much, not because of, like, the monster aspect, but the claustrophobia, you know? Like, imagining not being able to take off a mask. Because put on a rubber mask, you know, when it's hot or whatever, and let that thing kind of, you know, start sweating and get it stuck to your face. You know, it's just a very claustrophobic, scary feeling. Not to mention you're slowly turning into a monster yourself, but, uh, yeah, that all that that story always creeped me out as a kid. Uh, just the claustrophobia angle and uh, they've never captured that even in the old goosebumps thing they didn't capture what the book captured with that um so um, i'm disappointed to hear that this isn't like standalone episodes with different characters uh what's what the hell's the point you know <laughs> i don't they- know a lot of people seem to like it so it's just it's not my cup of tea I mean, um, I'll check it out. Yeah. I need to watch the new tell show, or I need to watch the new creep show season two, uh, as well. So, and get ready to binge Chucky as soon as I can. All three seasons. That's going to be fun. Yeah, let me know how that is. I just, I don't know. I, I like them when they're in the movies, but I feel like TV shows draw things out too much. So, who knows? I was just waiting until at least a couple seasons got finished. I didn't want to like really get into it and then have to wait, you know, seven, eight months for a new season. I hate doing that. Uh, I prefer to uh, have full access to the series or at least a few seasons ready to go uh, to enjoy. So I like the whole White House angle idea with Chucky. That's going to be interesting. Another thing I saw was, um, what do you know about Max Headroom? I remember in the 80s it being like a creepy like hack that somebody did on TV or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and it was a TV show or something at first. So a little bit of backstory on it, because I vaguely remember it, but it was really an 80s thing. Um, I guess what happened was with everyone, because the Internet was really primitive. Um, yeah. Someone created an artificial intelligence TV host called Max Headroom, and he was just like a floating head with like an upper torso, and he was like this. He like he insulted people. He was glitchy. You find out a long time later, um, it was actually a British studio using a Canadian actor, Matt Frewer, to be Max Headroom because he wanted to make fun of Americans and their obsession with TV personalities. So it was all a joke, but America loved it and, like, wanted to make him, like, the spokesperson for New Coke and everything. And I guess at one point they were like, we want to know Max's origin story. So they filmed a movie called Max Headroom 20 Minutes into the Future. And it's about a journalist that he's trying to uncover a company doing shady stuff. And as he is trying to escape a facility, he's trying to escape on a motorcycle And when he goes to jump out of the parking garage, they raise the ramp. And the last thing he sees before he dies is Max Headroom, six meters. And he cracks his skull on the sign and supposedly dies. Well, they're like, well, we can't have our famous journalist dead on the news. They're like, oh, well, we'll just take his brain and put it in a computer. But it got glitched and it became Max Headroom. But they made a whole TV show based on that premise. Um, So I I finally got to see the movie because they put it for free on YouTube. Did did, 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 did did they really is that <laughs> i thought it was yeah a it's, it, I didn't know it was a movie i thought max headroom was it, like, they turned it it was a tv show based on a movie and then they did like some tv stuff so it's it's kind of like elvira she had she did have a movie but she was mainly a hostess uh for late night movies so it's hard to really get the full impact of elvira without having lived through that era of when she was it's hard to well, you can't just like binge Elvira because she was she was bookmarks for shows and stuff. It's kind of Max Headroom. Okay. But I guess Max Headroom used to be what they say in parking garages, but because Max Headroom got so popular, they had to change it to Max Clearance. So that's why it doesn't it or Max Height, Max Clearance, because 
they don't say Max Headroom anymore because of him. Oh wow. Okay. But uh I love Matt Frewer, the actor. Um because you know you know One More Man too, how we said Job was too silly. Yeah. Well, someone was like, Well, I feel like Max Headroom it became Job. And if you look at it like that, if you look at One More Man Two as a sequel to Max Headroom, it actually flows a little bit better than a sequel to the first because that's the first time I heard I was like who the hell is Max Headroom and I looked it up and I was like oh yeah I, I, I've definitely seen him once or twice I think Matt Frewer has done more Stephen King movies than any other actor at this point mm -hmm. like um and it's so funny because Stephen King had such an aversion sued the makers of Lawnmower Man for calling it Stephen King's Lawnmower Man to, he sued to get his name off of there and then his number one star, <laughs> Matt Frewer, stars in the sequel to the movie that pissed off Stephen King. Uh, You're just the lawnmower man, Job. The lawnmower man is dead. <laughs> this, um, and they, now we're living in a, in a virtual reality world, uh, and they didn't get any of it right, really. <laughs> uh, I think my favorite part is he's a, he's a super genius, and he was like, I will control every computer in the world. I will control all the ATM machines. And I'm like, the ATM machines? The automatic teller machine machines? <laughs> um, But I guess they did turn on more Man into a, a game for the NES. Um, I was looking through a walkthrough, and people say, like, say what you want about the movie. The game's fucking awesome. Really? And I've been, I've been listening to the, ga the game soundtrack and stuff. They said, yeah, it actually was a pretty good uh, Nintendo game. I'll tell you a great Ninten Super Nintendo soundtrack for a game, and that's the... Uh picture that's behind me right now which is actually the the remake graphics of super mario rpg on the super nintendo it was called legend of the seven stars it's my favorite game of all time one of the first games i ever beat the first rpg i ever beat uh was my introduction to rpgs really and i've never looked back uh, the game was really quirky really weird had a lot of adult humor in it just was such a strange Mario game. And uh, people wanted a sequel for years. But Nintendo, what, what it is, Nintendo let Square make the game. Like, they actually let them have their characters. And, like, there's a couple original characters up there, too. And Nintendo got kind of upset at Square over some stuff. And they had, like, arguments. So when Mario RPG 2 was announced for the N64, uh, Square dropped out. And they had to, Nintendo had to go in a different direction and change the name, and we ended up ended up with Paper Mario, which is still going to this day, even though the first two are the only true RPGs in the series. But anyways, nobody ever thought this game would get a true sequel or ever see the light of day outside of like virtual console. And uh, back in June, just out of the blue, Nintendo announced a remake, and uh, it's. They've added cutscenes, updated the graphics, the soundtrack. The soundtrack is one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard in a 16-bit game back in the day. Very memorable stuff. They've updated it. It's it's just as good. It, it lets you actually alternate during the game if you want to go back to the retro soundtrack. So any Mario fans if you and RPG fans, if you've never tried Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars for the Super Nintendo you got to at least give Super Mario RPG. They've dropped the Legend of the Seven Stars tagline, but try Super Mario RPG. It's a remake of that game, and it's it's one of the funnest Mario games you're ever going to play. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm, I'm like, geeking out for this. I uh, could not believe it actually got a remake. And it's getting a lot of pop, a lot of high scores. It's really popular right now. It's going viral, and I'm hoping that will lead to finally having a sequel to it. That would be like a childhood dream come true. So, yeah. Sorry, it wasn't horror-related, um, but it's been a lot of fun recapturing my childhood. And, uh, yeah, hope, I hope some of you might give it a try, too. You too, Sean. It's fun. Well, that's like the Oregon Trail game we're playing right now. Do we discuss that? Yeah. No, we can no, we saying... discuss it again. We just we've talked about it before, but uh, very little. It's is it's oh they um they added new trails. Now you can do the California Gold Rush Trail on 
the Oregon Trail where you're you actually have like miners and nitroglycerin and you're going on a different path. So they just added a few more paths. So we're playing those and they're pretty fun. We uh we were just playing today and one of our one of our party, I guess she's paranoid and she was like, I hear creaking. There's a problem with the wagon. And we're like, there's no problem with the wagon. And she insisted there was a problem with the wagon. So she had she she it was like who was gonna be the carpenter? And you know, we didn't have the stats, so we didn't know who the best carpenter was. So we're like, okay, well, if you heard the problem, you fix it. She hit it with the hammer so hard it activated the nitro and blew half our wagon apart. And it was like we struggled through the trail after that. And it was like, wow, like our whole wagon was like burned out, and we had to we traded almost all of our gold trying to fix our wagon, getting halfway to California, and we ended up with like barely any gold by the time we got to California. And it was oh, like, man. wow, just got, that game got, is really fun. You and your family got dysentery, blew up the bathroom, and then literally blew up the wagon. <laughs> oh, do you have? Did you you heard the news story where that actually happened, right? What? There, I can't. It was like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or something, but the police got called because there was a bomb threat. And it turns out someone said that someone heard someone say they were going to blow up the bathroom and somebody took it as a threat and called it in. They had the squad out there and they're just like, oh, oh my God, oh. You, you did not. Apparently the person had never heard that like phrase before. So they just oh. didn't think about it before they called the cops. Were they Gen Z? They had to have been Gen Z, right? Like. <laughs> Even the reporter halfway through was like, oh, I just got that. Wow. Oh my God. That's great. I would love to have been a fly on the wall uh, to to hear the, uh, the cops talking about that one afterward. <laughs> I'm trying to think of any other horror movies I saw. Oh, um, did you see Saw 10? Did we talk about that? Uh, it's, it's on my urgent to-do list, but somebody kind of spoiled a lot of it for me so we can mm -hmm. talk about it. Well, all I was going to say is that it's better than a lot of people expect because there's a lot more emotion and heart in it because it takes place after Saw 1. Yeah. Um, I love the soundtrack, and I was uh, doing some research. Somebody wrote an article, and they said, you know, the Vincent Price movie in 1970, The Abdominal Dr. Fives, is a precursor to Saw. And I had never heard of that movie. So The Abdominal Dr. Fives in 1970 is about Vincent Price and... He's going after the nine doctors and nurses that did surgery on his wife and she died on the operating table. And he was rushing because he has multiple degrees in music and engineering and everything. And he crashed his car on the way to go to his wife and he was presumed dead. But he has been spending years crafting these like insane jigsaw traps for every one of the doctors and nurses responsible but he's trying to craft them to be the 10 plagues of Egypt. So boils, he put bees in someone's room um, for frogs. He put this like, you know, he, he, he did all the different traps trying to be the, the 10 plagues. And it was weird because he put bats in someone's room and some guy got eaten alive by bats. And I'm like, that's not one of the 10 plagues, but the director was like, yeah, I know it's flies but I can't film flies. It doesn't work. So I did bats because they're bigger. So sue me. Half these things were difficult to film. Um, there's even a part where like he sews a key into some dude's chest and tells the other guy he has to operate on the dude before the acid flows down. I mean, it really was saw. Wow. Um, Watch that. I, it's one thing I it's, know it's free on YouTube. Okay. The one thing I know about Saw X that I was excited is because uh, what got spoiled for me was the end credit scene with Hoffman. And uh, anybody that's watched our discussion on the Saw franchise knows Hoffman's my favorite jigsaw. Like, I know that's very unpopular, but the dude literally took a front row seat to one of his traps, like with the glass coffin. I'm not going to go back down that whole rabbit hole and get back into how cool I thought that was. Uh, but just knowing that Hoffman at least has that small part in the movie is uh, got me excited to watch it. Uh, I, I well, because it's in certain. So what? I heard he had a deleted scene as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. But what'd you say? Well, I remember when um 
<laughs> I remember back in the day when I would see Saw in theaters and then when it came out on DVD, it'd be like the unrated cuts. And I'm like, why can't we just have the theatrical cuts? Because some of the DVDs, I thought the unrated version was better. Some I thought the rated version was better, but I don't like how you didn't get to choose. I, I, I didn't like how it, you had to dig to try to get the theatrical cuts, but um, maybe when they release the movie but they don't really release stuff on dvd anymore so maybe they'll release the rated or unrated cut on prime or something and we can um see the deleted scenes that'd be that'd be cool do like a little review or something together like a full review since we did we did do uh the the saw franchise we did get spiral in, in on that right no this little guy is making my life difficult because i keep he keeps stealing like He's like headbutting me and he tried to take my pen. He just he, he wants me to focus on him right now. Did anybody get mad at you during the movie because you were seesawing or whatever? Dad joke incoming. You said you used what? to seesaw in the theaters. And uh ha. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah, there were there were a surprisingly lot of people at the theater for Saw 10. And um it was I just you know it was really emotional. The only thing I didn't forgive. There's a character, you know, spoil, I don't want to spoil anything if y'all haven't seen it, but there's a character from the old Saws that comes in and their wig is absolutely fucking terrible. I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting older, but my God, can you at least get a decent wig? Like, it was just, I, I couldn't think any, of anything else. I just, it's, it reminds me of that show Once Upon a Time where every time they tried to de-age someone, they just put him in like hipster clothes with a beanie and hipster glasses. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with being 48, but stop pretending you're 19. Like, come on. It's just what it's embarrassing. Saw 8, though? Because Jigsaw is kind of a Saw 0. Or a Saw... That one's hard. That, that was like the first trap, right? So... And then Spiral isn't even Saw. Like, it's not tied to the actual <laughs> stuff. So one day I want that one day it'd be cool if they finally announced they were going to stop that somebody would completely cut up all the movies and put them in chronological order. But it would be so fucking weird. It would just be like, um, it would just be difficult. I think instead of trying to keep making these like requels and sequels and all this crap, they should have kept doing what spiral started where it's like, spiral from the book of saw you know like it's like like we talked about where it's like a cult you know that just grows around the world of, of jigsaws you know like in different areas there was another movie series we said could do the same thing and i for the life of me i can't remember it right now uh because we we talked about it recently what was that movie franchise um just like saw and spiral we said it could be like that too where it just spreads or whatever but um, yeah, anyways, uh, that, I don't know, I'm just not too big on them. It feels like too big of a cash grab, kind of like all these Scream sequels we keep getting. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to, and since you liked it, that gives me some hope. Um, I don't know. Seven was supposed to be seven, eight, and nine combined to one movie, right? Like, originally. Yeah. So, it, it, Maybe, maybe some ideas they had that they never got to do got used in this. I will say they, they showed that one trap um, where it's like break your fingers or have your eyes put out or whatever. Was yeah. was there something stopping that guy from just breaking all his fingers at once? Did he have to do it one at a time? You'll, you'll see. Trust me. Okay. Because that one had... It, me it's, I, I was satisfied. I was satisfied with almost everything in this movie. So just, you know... Okay, well, I was scratching my head thinking, just break all your fingers at once, trap me. No, tr trust me, just just watch it. You'll, okay. you'll, I think you'll be pleased. Okay. <laughs> man, I feel bad keeping you, man. <laughs> it's it's fine. I, I feel like with the holidays and everything, the next time we do this episode, it's going to be like weeks after the fact. Maybe. But I'm trying to think of any horror movies I want to see. Did you did you watch Pope's Exorcist? Uh, no. Is, is it something you actually watched though? Like you actually liked it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Talked, I will admit we talked about the trailer and we kind of laughed at it. So, um, 
So I don't know what the hell I thought I was watching. Um, there is a movie that came out in 2011 called The Right with Anthony Hopkins about okay. exorcism or something. Yeah. I thought that's what I fucking started. And I it had been years since I saw the trailer. I just saw Pope's Exorcist and I said, oh, I've always wanted to see The Right. So I watch it. And I finished it, and I'm like, Anthony Hopkins wasn't in that. It was Russell Crowe. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I didn't write, I didn't watch the right movie. Apparently, Pope's Exorcist just came out. I thought Pope's Exorcist was like 10 years old. Um, I will say, um, I don't know if y'all know this, but Russell Crowe actually had a serious back injury on the set because he had to carry the goddamn movie on his back. <laughs> um, because if it wasn't for him, it would have just been your generic exorcism movie. But he's very playful like like he's been, like he's like if you don't figure out a way to laugh doing exorcisms this job is gonna eat you alive okay and his character actually like at one point he performs an exorcism and they're just like you had no authorization he goes it wasn't an exorcist because there was no demon 90 percent of the time there isn't these people are sick they need mental health i recommend them to a clinic very few and far between are there ever demon possessions but this is this movie is when they were trying to modernize the church and do away with exorcism. So it, it's there's a lot of like science mixed with magic in here. There is one, there's a throwaway line in this movie that kind of excuses the Spanish Inquisition, which I was not okay with that because nothing fucking excuses that. But if you take that with a grain of salt, the movie is enjoyable. But I found out that the movie is done by a lot of the writers and producers of The Right 2011. So that's why they feel very similar. Okay. Yeah, they do. So, similar, just watching the trailers for them. And retro. So I don't don't expect magic. Just it's it's a fun romp. It's not breaking any new ground on anything. Have you watched any classic horror movies that you missed out on uh, growing up lately? Um, I saw The Bob for the first time, the nineteen fifty one. Oh, have you? You've seen the eighties one, right? Nope. Oh man, that one is the. Quest. I missed out. Um, that one is good too, um, but the fifties one is fun. It's very, it's very, ah, uh, you know. And then like uh, minutes you're filming, you know, the monsters like all of a sudden pixelated and everything. With the bullies, the drag racing, and all the white people, it almost felt like Greece if there was a blob. <laughs> so that's kind of how the original felt. Had me a uh, lot. Ah! Um. You know, I've I've branched out on these fan novelizations I wanted to bring up before we ended and everything. Um, have you... I know you're voicing a character in Child's Play, which that one's a lot of fun. Uh, the author of that is actually going to be working on a Jason Goes to Hell fan novelization when he finishes Child's Play. And Adam nice. is going to give him some notes, the writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell. He's going to dive into some characters. He's going to tie part eight to part nine. Could be oh, a nice. collaboration from my head, you know, my whole... I'd love to know more about Creighton Duke. Like, that character did not get justice. No, no. And maybe we can find out why the donut... And the well, he did, he did in William Pattison's novel, but, you know, it would have been nice to see that fleshed out in the movie. And, you know, the Halloween 5 novelization, I'm actually enjoying that one. I don't really enjoy the movie. In fact, I've riffed that movie. <laughs> but the book is actually a lot of fun to narrate. You know, uh, these fan novelizations are actually a lot of fun. Um, I had to put Freddy versus Ash down for a minute. It's not that I don't like the book because it's fun, but there's a lot of it's kind of like these black flame books where they filled pages. I feel like the person wanted to make a really long book and they didn't have to. Like I'm 13 chapters into this book, like 13 uploads. and it's like a third of the book, you know? And I was like, okay, I got to put it on the back burner for a second. Cause I was starting to get death moon. I'm not saying the book is as bad as death moon, but I was getting burnt, uh, burnt out. Right. It's on the back burner. I'm going to finish it one day, but I think Halloween five child's play, uh, they've been a lot of fun. And uh, Landon Turner's final, he's done writing, writing at least for a while, Friday the 13th, seven, he finished it. I'm going to fin. I put out the prologue. And uh, I'm going to do that one after I finish either Child's Play or Halloween Five. <clears throat> the moment my voice, the moment my voice is back to normal, I'll uh, get 
uh, restarted on those lines right now. Oh. I got through uh, chapter ten. Yeah, I sent you. Uh, he sent. He just finished up some more chapters. I uh, sent it to you. So. I don't know what the hell voice I was going for. I think I was trying to do New, uh, Chicago cop, but then it kind of went to New York cop. Then it kind of went to Southern a little bit. Like I don't. I don't know. No one paid me. No one trained me. You get what you pay for. So. At, least, hey, at least you're not going for you. You don't sound like a gay Jack Nicholson on Family Guy. You know, wasn't that the insult I got for my for my Chucky voice? Yeah, God, yeah. I sound like a cartoon. But uh, anyways, uh, got any more notes for us? Or let's see. No, that's about it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any movies coming out. I know thank Thanksgiving the horror movie got a lot of good reviews, but I might wait till uh uh renting that one. I don't know many people that want to go see something that gory, so that might just be a me thing. Uh, I mean, Ghostbusters Ocean Empire looks good. Like, <clears throat> looks really good. I, I I love Ghostbusters Afterlife. Love the love the frame. I got a damn Ghostbusters tattoo. Man, now I'm losing my voice. What the hell? Um, Frozen Empire, like they showed every OG living Ghostbuster in the trailer. Pat Oswalt sent it. I know a lot of people are upset about that, but I actually like him. It's like having a real fanboy in the movie. Um, and if you've never seen the show, um, oh my God, what's it called? 404, Dimension 404. It's on Hulu. It's like a Twilight Zone type show but with tech and there's an episode where um, these aliens are taking over earth through like 3d in movie theaters. It's pretty cool. Patton's in that one of the best performances I ever seen him do acting wise. Um, yeah. I'm excited for ghostbusters uh, frozen empire. I think that's going to be good. And finally an original villain again. It's not like a return of Gozer or return of Vigo. We get the OG ghostbusters teaming up with the new ones. Just seeing the trailer, like New York being frozen over and all of a sudden Ecto-1, you know, and the siren. It's hitting all the right feels. I'm going to get some Ecto cooler, I bet. So, yeah, I'm excited about that one. I know I know how to close out my side of it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, first of all, Godzilla minus one is going to come out in about a month. And I'm really excited to see that in the theaters. But... I was doing some reading on the making of the original uh, Godzilla from Japan, uh, Gojira. Yeah. I found out they actually copied quite a bit from an American monster movie called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, mm -hmm. which is based on a novel. And it, when I watched the trailer, it, let me know if you've heard this plot before, right? Okay. So a giant dinosaur lizard is awakened by nuclear test and terrorizes New York City. I was like, oh my god, I, I know God, the Japanese based that on for Godzilla, but then when America did their version, it was a giant iguana tearing up New York City. So I'm like, wait, if you just disconnect Godzilla and you call Godzilla 1998 a remake of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, everyone would have been happy, but because they called it Godzilla, just like, I don't want to get into that rant again. I just I just found the trailer for that movie, and now I want to watch it. So I got to well, find that and watch yeah, it. I totally agree. That movie, by any other name, it would be a beloved classic. I'm glad it's getting more love nowadays. Same with Child's Play, the remake. Any other, any other name for the doll, no ties to Child's Play, would have been a great AI gone bad. Hollywood needs to learn its lesson. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great closer. Um, if that's it, man, it's been a fun chat. I hope everybody has a happy Thanksgiving. I hope we're back before Christmas. We should be, uh, if not have a happy Thanksgiving, uh, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, whatever it is you're celebrating. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel, Sean. Yeah. Um, as far as what I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for you, thankful for this channel. It's it's always fun to do this. And I will just leave out with a little uh, message of positivity that whenever a lot of people that you meet are going through things that you might not know about whatsoever, just remember, be kind to one another, be understanding. And um, maybe if we share and open up some of these conversations, we can hopefully 
become more positive and a little more kind and caring. So I just want to leave that here. So uh, thank you to everybody for whoever supports this channel and uh, is keeping this going and growing for years to come. Dare I say, be excellent to each other. And I'm thankful for all of you, sincerely. Um, and thankful for your friendship, Sean. And uh, yeah. have a great week, everybody. All right.